Guy's out for a little Sunday drive in the country, and uh, he sees off to the side of the road, there's two rabbis with long beards and black coats, black hats. They're standing off at the side of the road, and they're holding this big hand-painted sign. Big giant sign takes two of them to hold. It says, turn back, turn back. The end is near. Guy rolls down the window and says, you religious nuts, stay out of our lives. And he goes whizzing around the corner, full speed. Second later, they hear the squealing of brakes, and then a big splash. One rabbi turns to the other and says, we have to reword that sign and just write, the bridge is out ahead. We're going to talk about return. We're going to talk about teshuva. Because Parshas Vayelech, when it's on its own, not when it's Nitzavim and Vayelech, but when it's just Vayelech, is Shabbos Shuvah, the Shabbos known as Shabbos Shuvah. Sometimes it's called Shabbos Teshuva, sometimes Shabbos Shuvah. The meaning is the same. It is the Shabbos of return, and it makes sense that it has such a name because it is the Shabbos between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's the Shabbos within the 10 days of awe. So we're going to talk a little bit about Teshuvah, about return, about repentance, and what it means, and what's it all about. As well as its connection to Parshas Vayelech. I think one of the big misunderstandings about Teshuva is that it's um, morose, morbid. People who are fearful and self-loathing and Teshuva often gets a bad rap. When the truth is that the inner quality of Teshuva is really joy because Teshuva means return, reinstatement, being restored to your factory default settings of your soul, which is oneness with Hashem, Get, getting rid of all the gunk that got piled up and is separating us between, uh, between us and Hashem, God forbid, and just getting back to our pristine natural state of connectedness. So Teshuvah is a wonderful thing. It's very joyful. In fact, the way Panimiya Satoida explains it, the serious days of Tishrei, of the high holiday season, which are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, really, in their inner core, are joyous days. But the joy has to, it takes a certain amount of time to come out. So in the, the first half of the month, it's very serious. Rosh Hashanah, we're king, crowning the king, Hashem. Yom Kippur, we're, we're cleaning off all of the, uh, the aforementioned gunk. And then... After that, it takes a turn for more uh, overt joy. The simcha, uh, the simcha of, of Sukkot. Sukkot is called Zman Simcha Seinu, the time of our joy. Shemin Atzeres, and of course Simcha's Teira, the, the joy hits a, a peak. It's a, it's a time of, of great uh, rejoicing, dancing. And Pneumia uh, Satoyed explains that it's all one progression. It's really the, the, the latent joy that was in those two serious days comes out in a manifest form in the, in the later half of the month. It, it's actually compared to the progression of the moon during the month of Tishrei. When we start at the beginning of, of Rosh Hashanah, it's the first day of the month. It's the first day of Tishrei. So on Rosh Chodesh, on the first day of the month, the moon is, is, is but a sliver. And then Sukkot is the fifteenth of the month when the moon is when the moon is full, so it symbolizes the the revelation of of the concealment. There are, there are many um, ways that this Pneumia Satoida explains that, that explains how Sukkot and Simchas Teira is really the outer manifestation of of Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur. Of course, there's the uh, Kabbalistic explanation that um, the the Srach and the Sukkah. Srach is the, the covering, the foliage on top of the sukkah. So that's um, Samech Chof Chof, which is 60, 20, 20. So that's, a, that's 100 in total. So that is the outer manifestation of the 100 koilois, the 100 shofar blasts on Rosh Hashanah. And, and there are many such uh, comparisons made. The point I'm trying to bring out is that although teshuva can be serious business, at its core... What it really is is joyous all along, even if that joyousness is is um, latent or concealed. You know, a, a friend of mine uh, told me that he and his friend, when they were when they were Bachram in uh, back in yeshiva, 
they had a Mivtsoyim, a Mivtsoyim route. That's something Lubavitcher boys do. They go Friday afternoon on Mivtsoyim and to do the mitzvah campaigns of the Rebbe. So they used to have a Mivtsoyim route in Manhattan. They would go to a, a bunch of different offices Friday afternoon to help put on tefillin, bring Shabbos candles, and uh, help the people with whatever mitzvahs they needed help with. So one of the boys got engaged and got married. So uh, they invited the people on their Mivtsoyim route. Anyway, the friend of mine who didn't get married, <coughs> he eventually got married. <coughs> that, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cough. About I got tested, it's nothing serious. Anyway, so the friend of mine who didn't get married at that point, he continued going on, on the Mivtsoyim route. So anyways, he, he shows up Friday afternoon after the wedding, and one of the, one of the guys looks really, really serious, and he, and he says, you know, feel really uncomfortable asking you this, but is, and he named the name of the, the other boy, who did, he didn't come anymore because now he's a married man, so now you know, he has obligations at home. So it was just the unmarried guy with a, with a new friend. So the, this guy in this office in Manhattan, he says to my friend, is so-and-so, and he names the other boy who just got married last week, is he happily married? So my friend says, I think so. Why are, you, why are you asking? He says, because he looked really, really serious at his wedding. You know, normally a groom is joyful and he looked so serious. I'm just wondering, maybe, you know, he was pressured into it. Maybe he doesn't like the girl. So my friend's trying to figure it out. He says, hold on a second. What time did you come to the wedding? He says, I came at the time of the invitation. <laughs> he says, oh, that's your first problem. You showed up on time. He says... What what part of it did you see? He says, you know, the the, the outdoor part, the chuppah. He says, and, and, and then and then what? He says, no, that was it. I had to go home. I went home. He says, you didn't come to the hall for the dancing? He's like, no, no, no. I, I was uh, that was already you know two hours. I I had enough. I went home. He says, so you missed it. You came to the chuppah. The chuppah is a very serious thing. That's when two souls become one. Later on, when we celebrate the two souls becoming one, if you would have come to the hall, whoa, you would have seen a whole different scene. He was up on the table, and he was dancing, and it was really, really festive. So uh, what, am I, what am I saying here? I'm saying that it's not that a chuppah is a sad event. No, I'm not going to make misogynistic marriage jokes. No, sorry. Uh, a chuppah is not a sad event. A chuppah is a joyous event. But it's serious. Then later on, at the Simchas Chos Vikalo, when you're at the hall, then the joy that was latent within the chuppah becomes manifest. It comes out, and that's when we're all dancing, and uh, it's an overtly festive of, uh, occasion. And that's sort of like Tishrei, the, the whole high, high holiday month. It starts off, it's always joyous. From the beginning it's joyous, but the joy is hidden, it's latent, and then it comes out more uh, expressed. And that's the process of the high holidays, which takes a few weeks. But now I'm going to talk to you about sidestepping the process. A hack. <laughs> How to uh, accelerate your Tishrei, as it were. And uh, I, I think I'll start like, like this. Did you know that Simchas Torah, in one way, is this Shabbos, Shabbos Shuva. You're going to say, hold on, wait, wait, hold on, you just told me Shabbos Shuva is a Shabbos between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We didn't even get to Yom Kippur yet. And you're going to tell, tell me, this is Simchas Torah. No, no, hold on. Simchas Torah is way after Yom Kippur. You have to go through the whole Sukkot, and you go through the through Shemini Atzeres, and then the last thing is Simchas Torah. Now you're going to say that Simchas Torah is before even Yom Kippur? And I'm going to say, yes, in a certain way, yes. There are two ways of looking at it. There is the Simchas Torah that you know of, and I know of, and it's written about in Shulchan Aruch, and we all observe at, on the last day, of of uh, of Sukkot, the ninth day actually, because the eighth day is the extra day of Shemini Atzeres, and then the ninth day in Chutz Laaretz is the day of Simchas Torah. That's the one we all know about. But I'm going to tell you about the hidden Simchas Torah that occurs even before Yom Kippur, and that is this Shabbos. 
it says in Parshas Vayelech, our Parsha, the Yichtev Meisha as Hatayra Hazais, Meisha wrote this Tayra, the Yitna, and he gave it Al Hakayhanim Bnei Levi to his tribe members so that they should put it in the Ark and it should be there present in the Ark. Rashi says the Yichtev Meisha. Meisha wrote the Sefer Torah, the Yitna, and he gave it. Kishenigmara Kula, when he finished all of it, when it was all finished, Nasana Livnei Shivta, he gave it over to the members of his tribe. In other words, this week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayelech, although it is not the last Parsha of the Torah, there's two more Parshas, there's Hazinu and there's Vizay Sabracha. But they all take place on the last day of Meisha's life. They're all on his 120th birthday. In fact, that's the beginning of Vayelech. It says, today is my 120th birthday. Moshe is speaking. And he, he lived 120 complete years. So he passes away on, <coughs> on his 120th birthday. And what happens on that day? He finishes the writing of the Sefer Torah. Now, I know you're going to say, hold on a second. How did he finish the writing of the Sefer Torah? There's two more parshas. How do those parshas get in the Sefer Torah if it's finished? Torah does not follow chronological order. So this Pasuk is talking about something that happens later, later in this day. So something that happens in Vayelech, not that hard to follow, something that happens in Vayelech, although it's the, not the last Parsha, it's not the second to, last parsha, second to last Parsha, it's the third to last Parsha, but something that happens in this Parsha, Vayelech, is the last thing. It's finishing the Sefer Torah, the complete Sefer Torah. Now, in that sense, Vayelech is Simchas Torah. Vayelech is the completion of the Torah. Not when we complete reading it. We complete reading it on Simchas Torah, the, what we, we know of as Simchas Torah, when we finish Parshas Vezeis HaBracha. But when Torah describes the finishing of the Torah, Kishenigmara Kula, like Rashi says, when it was completely finished, that's this week's Parsha, Vayelech, which is Shabbos Shuvah. So isn't that funny that in a certain way, Simchas Torah, in a hidden way, is this week's Parsha, which is Shabbos Shuvah. How do we explain that? Seems funny. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's a well-known story. It's story 3,823, I believe. That's just a joke, but it's one of those well-known stories. About, you know which story it is, right? The Yim Kippur drunk. Now you know. Now you for sure know. The Yom Kippur drunk is a story of Rav Levi Yitzchak And uh, here's how it goes. There was once a Jewish family that owned an, a tavern. That's how they made a living, which they rented from a, a non-Jewish nobleman. Jews couldn't own land, so they had to rent. So he rented from a non-Jewish nobleman, and he couldn't pay his rent. And once you know it, he was finally thrown in debtor's prison, him and his whole family. That's how they did it back then. So the, the Poritz, the nobleman, he took that, this Jew and his whole family, he threw him in a dungeon uh, right before Yom Kippur. So one of the, this was in Berdichev, one of the people in town in Berdichev says, well, that's not right, I'm not going to allow this to happen. So he starts going door to door begging for money. Come on, we've got to get this family out before Yom Kippur. Pidin Shvuyim, one of the biggest mitzvahs to redeem the captives. So he raised however much money he raised. Um, the total was 500 ruble. And when he was done, he only had 100. He had 100 ruble. He needed 400 more. But the community was totally blood dry. They had nothing. They scraped together everything they had. They had nothing. So he didn't know what to do. He needs 400 more ruble, and he has a few hours till Yom Kippur. He decides to go out on a limb. He says, you know, Berditcha was a big city. There was a part of the neighborhood, which was a Jewish neighborhood, but it was not religious. It was where the Jews who had drifted from Judaism lived. So he says, I'm going to go there to the non-religious Jewish neighborhood, and I'm going to see. Maybe they'll have some rachmonis, some compassion on their brethren. So he, where does he find them? It's, it's Erev Yom Kippur. You wouldn't even know it's Erev Yom Kippur because they're hanging out in a uh, bar, and they're drinking, and they're gambling. And he goes to them. He says, Jews... We are all brothers after all. Help a family. <coughs> Help them get out of prison before Yom Kippur. <coughs> and uh, nobody paid attention. They all ignored him. <coughs> so 
then there was this one joker. He thought it would be funny. He says, this, they were in a tavern, remember? So he says to the, uh, to the guy, you want something? You want, you want money? I'll, I'll give you 100 ruble from this table right here. If you drink this cup of vodka. No, this is not a cup of vodka, by the way. It was a big cup like this. You know, it was filled to the top with vodka. The real vodka, you know, Zex and Neinzike. That's not 96 proof. That's 96%. Anyways, he, uh, you know, like Everclear. So he says, drink this cup of Everclear. So he's like, please, Yom Kippur's in a few hours. I, I don't, I don't want to go to the hospital out of Yom Tov. He says, if you want 100 ruble, drink the cup. The guy is thinking, you know, I'm not going to let a family sit in prison. Yom Kippur, he says, fine, give it to me. And he drinks it, downs the whole thing. He's coughing and he's sputtering. But good to his word, the, this, uh, you know, this joker gives him the 100 ruble. So now he's got 200 ruble. He's closer to his goal. He says, Yidin, please have compassion. There's a family in prison. So another joker gets up from another table. He says, yeah, do the same thing for our table. Come on over. I do what you did over there. He says, please, I can't do it. I can't manage. He says, I'll give you 100 ruble. So they fill in a, uh, another cup. He drinks the cup down. And uh, they give him the 100 ruble. Now, now he's got 300. Another joker gets up and says, do it again for our table. Well, long story short, he gets the 500 ruble. And he has consumed four giant cups of uh, Zexa Neinziker alcohol. And uh, at this point, he's not even fully conscious. And he just, he mutters to somebody, please take me to the parrots, take me to the landowner so I could pay the debt. Somehow he had the presence of mind <coughs> to make that request. <coughs> and so they put him on a wagon. Somebody was kind enough to do so, and they brought him to the parrots, and he throws the 500 on the table, on the desk. Parrots counts it. Okay, good. And he lets the, uh, the Jewish family out of prison. Now it's like half an hour before Yom Tif, and the father of this redeemed family, he's so joyful, and he says, thank you. Well, how can I repay you? And this, this, this guy who's pretty much 90% uh, passed out, he just says, bring me to Shul. Bring me to Yim Kippur, Kol Nidre, bring me to Shul. So what do they do? They just, you know, they roll this guy to Shul, and he can't stand. They just lie him down in the back, you know, behind a bench. So there he is. He's passed out in Shul. Now, it's Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre, what do they do? It's very solemn. It's very, you know, it's a very intense setting. Everyone's there in their kittel, dressed in white, with their talis on. They open up the ark, the oren. They pull out the Sifre Torah, the Torah scrolls, and they hold them up by the bima, and the chazan intones that ancient and well-known melody of Kol Nidre, Kol Nidre, right? It's a very, very uh, serious and intense sort of situation, and everybody's in the moment, they're all in the mood, they're all getting into that Kol Nidre zone, and our friend starts to come too, and he sort of pull, pulls himself up and stands at his feet and he's he can't see straight he's still drunk i mean he, he just he just downed all that alcohol so he's still drunk he's trying to figure out what's going on he, where am i i'm in shul i'm in shul and the ark is open and all the torah scrolls are out and i'm drunk well it must be simchas Torah, right because in simchas Torah you open the ark and you take out all the torah scrolls and you dance with them and a lot of people are drunk so he puts two and two together, so to speak, and he says, It's Simchas Torah. So he says, That's the that's the, uh, the verse, one of the verses, the first verse that we say on Simchas Torah, a very lively fashion. Anyways, it, it's beautiful in Simchas Torah. It's totally out of place in the middle of Kol Nidre. I mean, they're in the middle of Kol Nidre, and he's standing up, drunk, staggering, and screaming at Teresa in a it, it's it's totally incongruous it's just not not the time not the place and people turn around and they're shocked who's this guy this is scandalous so is he making a joke is he is, 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 is he is he here to disrupt is he here to disturb throw him out get him out of here so the the shul uh, security you know they go they grab the guy 
and about to toss him out. And all of a sudden, the tzaddik, the holy Rav Levi Yitzchak Berdechever, he gets up, he says, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Leave him. Leave him be. The tzaddik knew what this man had done. He knew that this man sacrificed his Yim Kippur by drinking all that alcohol in order to raise the money to get a family out of prison for Yim Kippur. The Yitzhak Berdichever told the crowd, he said, leave him alone. For him, it is Simchas Torah. He has already bypassed the entire process. He has leapfrogged it. He went past Yom Kippur. He went past Sukkot. He went past Shmi Yaseris. It is Yom Kippur for him. I mean, it, it is, it is Simchas Torah for him. Although it's for us, it's still Yom Kippur. For him, he's at Simchas Torah. It's a beautiful story. And what I want to share with you is that... <coughs> In a certain way, now please hear me correctly, because obviously, <coughs> if you want to know when the real Yim Kippur is and the real Simchas Taita is, <coughs> you should look on your calendar and follow what the calendar says, because the calendar is what it says in Shulchan Aruch in the Code of Jewish Law. So I'm not suggesting to anybody to do Hakafas on Yim Kippur. What I am telling you is that in a certain way, in the panemius of it, in the latent, hidden way, it's not just that, that story. It's not just that guy from Berdichev 200 years ago who experienced Simchas Torah on Yom Kippur. It's actually all of us. All of us are already at Simchas Torah by the time we head into Yom Kippur. In fact, even a little bit earlier than Yom Kippur, because on Shabbos Shuva, when we read Parshas Vayelech, we read Vayichtayv Meisha Es Hatayra Hazais. Meisha wrote the Sefer Torah, and like Rashi says, Kishenigmara Kula, when it was completely finished. So Simchas Taira in Taira, meaning where Taira itself describes the completion of the Taira, is already in Parshas Vayelech, which is Shabbos Shuva. So in a certain way, we're already at Simchas Torah. And it makes sense that we should already be at Simchas Torah because, as we were mentioning before, the inner content of Teshuvah is joyful all along. Just like the wedding, even though you're serious at the chuppah, we're serious in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but the inner content of it, latently hidden within it, is the potential joy which we see come out at the at the, the celebration of the Chosin Kala, or in the sense, or in the, the, the context of Tishrei that comes out on Sukkot and, and Simchas Torah. So, that is the second Simchas Teira, the hidden Simchas Teira, that we should all be aware of as we go into Shabbos Shuva. And we should also keep in mind another connection, which is that Yom Kippur became Yom Kippur because it's also Simchas Teira. Well, what do you keep saying? Okay. I'm going to tell you what it says in the Mishnah in Tainus, at the end of Tainus. It says that Yom Kippur is a, is a joyful day. Why is Yom Kippur a joyful day? So Rashi explains there on the Mishnah that that's the day of the Luchai Shniyais, the second tablets. How did we know we were forgiven? Because after Moshe broke the first tablets, he went up and he begged for our forgiveness. And finally Hashem forgave him and got, took 40 more days to get a new hard copy, and he came down and gifted them to us on, on, on Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur is the day, Yom Kippur became Yom Kippur when it was the day that we received the second tablet. So Yom Kippur is the day we were gifted with the Torah, and not just gifted with the Torah, because that happened also before, these were the second tablets, but the second tablets, which are tablets for Balei Tshuva, for penitence. The first time we received the Torah, we were tzaddikim. We were, we were just coming out of Pesach. We were completely clean and brand new. Then a little interruption happened in the middle. We don't have to talk about that, you know, the golden calf. But then what happened is when we received the second tablets on Yom Kippur, we were penitents. But Mokim Shabali Tshuva Aimdim, we were standing in the place, the glorious place of those who returned to Hashem, who were far and become near. 
So Yom Kippur became Yom Kippur because of the Simchas Torah, in a hidden way, albeit in a hidden, in a hidden way. But we should appreciate this, that although on, on one level, there's a track where there's a progression, you have to go through Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres, and then finally you get to Simchas Torah at the end. And that's, that's the halachic way that we do it, and that's the way that's written in your calendar, and that's the way we're all going to do it. But there's another track, which is something just to keep in mind, just to, as a thought, as a meditation, as a kavona, if you will, a sort of inner intent, that as you go through the Tishrei process, you should realize that already at Shabbos Shuvah, Parshas Ve'yelech, we're already at Simchas Teira, we're already experiencing the joy. So even... At the serious time, we can feel already palpably the joy. And I think this also is a lesson to all of us in this generation where we are tangibly, palpably sensing the coming of Mashiach very, very soon. Yes, we're still in Gaulus. Yes, we're still doing the work of refining the world. And we're waiting very soon that there should be this unveiling of this new reality that had been latent within this world all, all along. But we should understand that it's not like one moment, all of a sudden, Mashiach's going to be here, and then boom, everything's going to change. It's already changing now. It's already changing now because the revelation that comes in the future was really in a hidden way, in a latent way, present all along. You know, that's the idea of Goyla and Geula. Goyla means exile, Geula is redemption. The only difference between the two words is the Aleph. The Aleph is, of course, Hashem, the one Hashem. So when Hashem's oneness is revealed, we see that the Goyla all along had the potential for Geula. And in microcosm, in the terms of uh, the Jewish year, we should realize that the joy of Simchas Torah was present already on Shabbos Shuvah. It was here all along. Have a happy Shabbos Shuvah.